everybody. I'm Kelly Kleiman, and this is the Prospect Blueprint. You know, there's a saying going around that if you're a talented player, they'll find you. You see it everywhere on social media. But that's only partially true because they need to be able to find you. If you can't afford to develop through training, travel ball, and pay for an opportunity to be in the right place at the right time, your odds of being found diminish drastically. Our guest today is the co-founder of a nonprofit organization that focuses on providing opportunities for young baseball players of color. The organization is called Club 42, and if you think there's a nexus between Club 42 and the spirit of all that Jackie Robinson stood for and embodies to this day, well, you'd be correct. I'd like to welcome John Buck Lockwood, otherwise known affectionately as Coach Johnny, to the show. How you doing, Coach? Uh, I'm well, Kelly. Thanks for uh, that wonderful introduction, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you today. Well, happy to have you. Now, Club 42 just had a big groundbreaking ceremony. Explain. Well, uh, yeah, it was a wonderful day at the Jackie Robinson Stadium, which is uh, UCLA's home stadium for baseball. It's also on the Los Angeles uh, VA campus. And what was very exciting for us is uh, my good friend and colleague uh, for many, many years, uh, John Branca and his son, Dylan Branca, who I, who I basically consider a surrogate godson after all these years, uh, they broke ground for what's going to be called Branca Family Field, which is a, uh, a practice diamond, a state-of-the-art practice diamond, which will be adjacent uh, right to the right field corner um, at Jackie Robinson Stadium um, by the gift cage that's there. And it's going to really, really change the dynamics for Coach Savage and UCLA. Uh, they're going to be able to do a lot more things with their program there, attract some fabulous talent but we're very excited because from a club 42 standpoint that that practice diamond now becomes a place where some of our young middle school kids that we sponsor from uh inner city neighborhoods so they can come up and they can get some great training and they can really expand their horizon so we're very excited about it all it was a great day he actually john is the nephew of ralph branca who was very close with Jackie Robinson. But before we get into the backstory and the societal significance and opportunity that Club 42 clearly represents, there's a big showcase event planned for September 21st and 22nd at UCLA. What is it and who's involved? Well, uh, I, thanks for asking, Kelly. It's, uh, we're very excited about it. it it's, uh, we're calling it the 42 One Glove Scout Ball Showcase. We're doing it in conjunction uh, with the 42. To, uh, Cubs scout ball team that we've recently uh, done a merger with with coach Don Moriarty as you know you work with coach and you know him well we're very excited about this event we're also invite club 42 has been around for about seven years now and we started as a middle school program to bring kids from all backgrounds together with a focus on black American kids from the inner city but we wanted them to come up uh, with kids from all over LA, uh, affluent kids, middle class kids, kids from all uh, backgrounds, uh, races, and creeds, uh, uh, what have you. And so now some of those kids have grown up and they've done their high, their high school seniors. Some are uh, listed as some of the top uh, prospects in the country. We've got a number of D1 commits. So we're going to bring them all together. And on Tuesday, the 21st, uh, Tuesday night, uh, Coach Savage has made the entire UCLA facility available to us at Jackie Robinson Stadium. We're going to bring together probably, I think, like 50 or 60 uh, kids, both from the Cubs organization and from uh, Club 42. And we're going to we're going to put them in the Club 42 uniforms on Tuesday night. And we're, we're going to sort of run a, a, a very professional batting practice, uh, a, a combo uh, group of uh drills and exercises for the players and we'll finish with a couple of innings of scout ball but it's a chance coach savage and his staff will be in the stands they're allowed to be in the stands and they're going to be watching uh and and looking for prospects and we're also going to have some coaches from other schools there and then the big night uh the next night we're going to suit up in uh 42 cubs uh uniforms and we're uh, going to have a scout ball game against glendale college and we're very very excited about it because um we're going to have some great talent on the field 
and we're bringing in uh, a big time sort of, if you will, ESPNU, perfect game, uh, production crew. I think we have five, six cameras going. Uh, we have talent in the booth. We have talent, uh, broadcast on the field. We've now got the scoreboard program, so it'll have instant replay, uh, all kinds of things that even UCLA hasn't been able to do. Um, and we're very fortunate um, for this very exciting event. And we're also going to mix in our next generation of middle school black American kids that we sponsor so they can see where the journey takes them from fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, right up to their senior year when college coaches are looking at them or they're, they're going through the commitment process. Now, you alluded to other colleges having the opportunity to be in attendance. Um, will they also be able to attend remotely? Is it going to be live streamed? Yeah, it is going to be live streamed. And, and I, I'm new to the live stream uh, baseball business, but the, the company that we've contracted does a lot of the big perfect game events, uh, a lot of the college um, tournament events. They're very professional um, we're very excited to work with them. I think it is going to be streamed on on the new Perfect Game channel. I believe that the final um, edited version of the game will be posted on MLB.com. And we're excited that we're um, we're going to collect content on all the players so families can come to us after this event and if they want to put together a highlight reel uh, on their young on their young prospect, we'll make that available to them. And everybody needs a highlight reel, right? Yeah, well, I, I'm, you know, I'm new, uh, new to the process. Uh, you know, I'm a little old school myself, but uh, I, I love putting together. We got a great group with Club 42, and we've been putting together some of these highlight reels and some of these, uh, uh, you know, opportunities for Instagram and social media. We've been putting together some fabulous video reels for, you know, about, we've been doing it for about four or five years now for the kids. Um, we've filmed them ever since they were little. You'll see it on the uh, uh, on the broadcast. They're gonna rather than have commercials, they're gonna be showing archival footage from all the filming and videoing we've done of our of our young prospects since they were in middle school. So you know we're excited about it. Side note: I've seen Dylan Branca's uh, his highlight reel, and he has a wicked yeah. curveball, and I think that that accentuated that highlighted yeah. that pitch very very well. And of course, he's a prospect who will be throwing as well. Uh, well, look, at this represents a great opportunity for all the players. It's very structured. Aside from the highlight reel, what would you expect the players' takeaway to be? Well, I think, you know, Don Moriarty uh, gets these, the, 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 the Cubs scout ball kids out in front of a lot of college coaches. He's great at it. And as you know, he, he often will get access to college fields, Pepperdine, Kyle Lutheran, but it's, it's a hard, it's hard to get on the Jackie Robinson field, particularly because um, uh, the VA has made it even harder with COVID. This was even with our relationship uh, with UCLA and the VA, this was not an easy uh, event to put together uh, logistically and with the bureaucracy. So one, I think it's going to be exciting for the kids to be at Jackie Robinson stadium. But I think one of the best takeaways they're going to get is I think Don Moriarty is going to run a great baseball event. They're going to get some great challenges because they're the Glendale team that's coming in. They also want to show Coach Savage what they can do. And some of the coaches that are going to be watching on live stream, a lot of these kids are looking to get their transfer deals. So the intensity is going to be high. This isn't going to be like a perfect game, 18U game. These are, uh, these are going to be some kids out there that are 19, 20, 21 years old, along with our kids, and um, they're going to be bringing it. It's going to be intense. Yeah. Everyone's going to be hungry with the advent of COVID. There were a lot of uh, bounce backs from D1 schools, D2 schools, D3 schools to JUCO, and those guys are looking for a place to play as well, and everybody wants to impress the numerous colleges that will probably be looking at this event. So let's get into the whole Club 42 thing. By the way, folks, is there a particular website or somewhere where they could get some more information on the event? Yeah, Yes, on the event, uh, we're keeping it pretty tight to the vest uh, because, uh, you know, we want this to be a – have a little bit of an exclusive feel for the players and the coaches. So we didn't really – 
pursue a, a general audience on this one, but they, they, they will find it. But um, we have a website, Club 42, uh, go42.org, that okay. might have some of the information, yeah. So let's talk about the backstory and the mission statement of Club 42. You alluded to it. Who's involved from an individual and organizational standpoint? Uh, well, uh, it, it goes back to 2014. It's a funny story. Uh, John Branca is the nephew uh, of Ralph Branca, and I knew Ralph for two decades, 20 years. Uh, for those that don't know, on April 15, 1947, when Jackie Robinson uh, ran out to um, take the field on that groundbreaking day, where he uh, broke the color barrier and, and, and if you will, jump-started the American Civil Rights Movement. Ralph Branca was standing next to him as his uh, white teammate, and obviously all of Jackie's teammates were white. And Ralph really embraced Jackie. Um, there, were, there were members of the Brooklyn Dodgers, as some people know from the movie 42, that were not so excited about uh, Jackie being there. Uh, a lot of people might know the, the famous shower scene in the movie 42, the, you know, the funny banter between uh, Ralph Branca's character and Jackie Robinson's character, you know, when they're standing naked in the shower. And it's, it's a funny scene if you haven't seen the movie. And but it, it, it embodies uh, the spirit and, and the love that Ralph and um, Jackie came to have for one another. And <clears throat> in 2014, after listening to almost 20 years of real Jackie Robinson stories from Ralph Branca. Mm. Uh, I was, at, I was, at, I was at the Branca Villa, John Branca's Villa, and we were sitting under uh, pictures of Ralph and Jackie. And he, he said, you know, my son, Dylan, of course, I know your son, Dylan, John, I've been throwing a baseball with him since he was four years old. And he's basically my son too. Um, he, he doesn't get to pitch uh, in these, in these daddy ball games, these youth games where the parents, uh, coach the team and my son is a good pitcher and he never gets to pitch. He says, you've got a baseball background, Johnny. Will you put together a, a travel team? Uh, Cause I think he just heard the phrase. And I said, you know, John, and I'll, and I'll be candid and I'll be candid for your, for your viewers here because I, I got introduced to the travel ball world and I come from the old school world where we played on playgrounds and things like that. And I said, you know, John, um, if you want to do a rich white boy team in the Valley, I've got a bunch of guys who would love to work with you and do that. And then I looked up at, at Jackie and Ralph and I said, but if you want to do the legacy, if you want to do the legacy of Ralph and Jackie, I'm interested. And he goes, well, I'm not sure you can do that. I'm not sure you can pull that off. I said, well, you leave it to me. And next thing he said, okay, go do it. Next thing I was off down to the uh, MLB UIA uh, campus in Compton with, uh, with our, co-founder along with John and I, Tim Leary, who pitched for the Dodgers and he still coaches with us. Um, and he was an all American at UCLA. And we went down, uh, to MLB UIA and we started to uh, meet people and we put club 42 together. Outstanding. And it's doing some great work. Of course, let's focus on coach Johnny for a few minutes. Interesting story. We had a, a conversation, <laughs> we've had a, a couple of different conversations, but but you were a multi-sport athlete with a very unique prospect blueprint of your own that led you from high school in Andover to the Ivy League to where you are now. It's really a compelling story of building bridges, creating opportunities, and acknowledgement for those other than yourself. Tell us your story. Well, I'll try and keep it succinct. Um, I'm, I'm the third generation in my family to have been a college baseball player. And yes, I was recruited in three Division One sports football hockey and baseball and I chose to turn football down um well that's another story but I, I stuck with hockey and baseball and actually hockey was my prime sport um but when I was at the University of Vermont before I went down and finished at Harvard um after my undergrad career I um was on the team and uh one my hockey teammate was a, a fellow named Kirk McCaskill who got drafted in the first round for baseball uh, that year by the angels. And when he left to go play for the angels, it left a spot open on the baseball team. And I didn't really want to play baseball because it's cold in new England. And I was always dreaming of coming to California and being a surfer as soon as my hockey career was gone. But because I'm a lefty, 
um, I said, oh, heck, I'll go out. And, you know, coaches are always looking for lefties. And anyone who's listening out there, if your kid's a lefty, teach them to pitch, <laughs> boy or girl. Yeah. And um, so that journey of being a lefty just sort of kept going. Um, years and years later, I hadn't picked up a ball in decades. And I was in Italy and uh, I was on doing some business over there and living over there in Tuscany. And they heard that I played ball and they signed me to play in the Italian league. And I don't know, then we won the Italian national championship and somehow I bounced back to America, found myself on independent league teams. Um, I, and, and somehow Tony Regan's from the angels found out that I threw some pretty good lefty BP. And in 2008, he had about five days to find a lefty batting practice pitcher. And he invited me out to Tempe when I was 46 years old to throw BP for the angels, Vlad Guerrero was hitting bombs out when I came out onto the field and I threw some BP for the angels. And when I came back from camp, um, you know, you get together with the guys, you have breakfast and somehow the fish went from being like a six inch minnow to a six foot, you know, tarpon or, tuna and i don't know how i ended up having a 10-year career with the dodgers but somehow i did and all these kids started coming up to me and asking if i'd teach them how to play baseball and pitch and that's how in my you know midlife i evolved into coach johnny classic classic story you know jackie robinson was so important for so many reasons in fact why we don't have a Jackie Robinson national holiday is beyond me because his inclusion into Major League Baseball, our true national pastime, was the first bold step towards the modern civil rights movement. Now, you have a well thought out theory on that subject that I, I wholeheartedly agree with. Please elaborate. Uh, well, thanks, Kelly, for asking. Um, you know, I don't want to be too iconoclastic. That's a vocabulary word I don't want to over. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. Um, but I got to call it the way I see it. And uh, what's happened, and let me work backwards. So in uh, about 10 years ago, I was at Jackie Robinson Stadium. And we were watching a, 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 you know one of the college uh, tournament games. And I looked out on the field, and I saw nothing but white faces. A lot of, a lot of really healthy, good-looking white baseball players and a black man uh, up on the uh, up on the you know along the right field line there of Jackie Robinson and I thought to myself how can it be that there are no black Americans on the college baseball field in 2010 called Jackie Robinson Stadium and that it, it sort of mortified me and I but it, I, you know I like to be a logical thinker so I thought about it and I and I did some research. And what I found out was that uh, during the Rod Dato era, which was the famous era of the 60s and the 70s, after Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier, there was as many as 30 full scholarships available uh, for a Division I baseball team. And there were many, many Black American talented baseball players because there were fields in the urban areas and in the rural areas and ball was still a top game. So a coach like Rod Dato, he could get plenty of black American talent and you could see that it would matriculate onto the major leagues in the late seventies. And I, uh, by nobody's conscious, uh, conspiracy, it's just one of these sort of accidents that, that can happen when they title nine came along, which made it, uh, so that there would be equal scholarships for women as there are for men on college campuses. It limited Division I baseball scholarships down from as many as 30 to 11.9, where it is today. Yeah. And one of the problems that that made for the baseball coaches yeah. is they immediately had to break up. The NCAA said you can break up those scholarships. And so as Coach Savage said to me uh, a few years ago, after almost two decades of giving out scholarships, he said, Johnny, I've only given out three full scholarships my entire time at UCLA. And that means that uh, it, it became a game that was pricing out the black community just at the college level. But there's a little more to the story. And by the way, I'm a fan of Title IX. My mother created five uh, Division I college athletes in six different sports. 
Um, but all of my younger siblings, uh, my four younger siblings are women. <laughs> and so Title IX it would, did, gave my family a tremendous boost. And I know it's given a lot of young women around America a tremendous boost. And it's a wonderful thing for our culture. But through no fault of anyone's, it, it participated in decimating black American baseball. And to compound the problem, he then had the, that urban, the urban environments became all the fields, uh, pretty much many of them got mowed down. And with baseball, you, you need more than just a baseball field to, you know, to train a shortstop or to train an outfielder. They got to have a yard. They got to have a field. They got to be able to catch fly balls. They got to have dads, brothers who can go out there with them. And sort of that all by through decades of attrition, the fields went away in, in urban America, the scholarships went away, and you had this sort of uh, unconscious conspiracy, which pretty much drove most of the great black American athletes out of the game of baseball. Yeah. And it's frustrating because when, when I see MLB or other groups trying to restore the game of baseball, it's really an uphill battle because one, the scholarships aren't there, and to the fields are yeah very true very true and i agree with you now let's talk about your current initiative it's called balls and books peel back the onion on that well uh, well little alliteration we, it's club 42 books and balls program and books and balls we actually, books first yeah book the books and balls that's it okay. that's right always scholarship and academics first because that's where you're going to spend most of your life is in your mind and the body tends to wear down before the mind. So um, what it is, is when we started club 42, we didn't know that we were doing what we now call a books and balls program. But what books and balls is, is that we would meet um, at the UCLA cage, which is a, a small uh, space sports area where you've got batting cages, you've got uh, places where you can take some ground balls and you can, have some indoor mounds and do some pitching. And what, one of the things we were able to really work on in a tight, confined space was pitching lessons and hitting lessons. And we were doing it. And then we also helped for some of our kids get them tutoring afterwards. And the deal was if you came down to our books and balls practice, even though we didn't call it books and balls, then you get a pitching lesson, you get a hitting lesson and we do some tutoring. Well, Sometimes I would go into the outfield. Uh, the outfield fence is right next to the cage. Or we renovated a field down in Inglewood called Rogers Park. Similar situation, batting cage and mound and a little league field. And I would say to the pitchers, I would go, hey, hey, guys, you know, pitchers need to run. Do you want to run sprints or do you want me to throw you some footballs? And you can imagine what the unanimous answer was. They wanted to throw footballs. And throw, I would, so I would throw them footballs while my other giving pitching and hitting lessons. So here you have these young black American kids. They're learning how to pitch. They're learning how to hit. They're learning how to catch footballs. And then when the weather would get kind of crappy and the fields would get messed up, we would play three-on-three -three basketball, all in a tight space. And then I realized, and we, we, you're going to see one of our young men. He's one of the top uh, black American pitchers in the country right now. His name is Cassius Thomas. And when Cassius was in about middle school, he became a pitcher only primarily with Club 42. And now Cassius is committed to Duke. He just pitched in the uh, high school all-star game for MLB at Coors Field. And he is a wonderful example of a black American student athlete who has found tremendous success as a pitcher only. And so then I looked at the history of Jameis Winston, uh, the the famous Heisman Trophy quarterback from Florida State, I noticed he was also a pitcher only. And it gave me the idea that maybe there would be an opportunity to get more black American kids into the game of baseball if they focused on either hitting, which opens up being a DH, being pitcher only, because that can be done in a small space sports environment, get them some receiving and some quarterback skills, get them some basketball skills, keep those doors open for them if they want to play football or basketball where they can get a full scholarship, but they don't have to give up the game of baseball. And we see there are a number of examples across America, not many, they're rare, 
where you have some two sport black American athletes where either basketball or football are paying their college tuition, but they're still able to play on the baseball team. Yeah. So we just decided to tighten that up. And we now have about uh, 10 young middle school kids in our, in our books and balls program. You're going to see them at the one glove event. We're going to get them out on the field. Differences is they're going to play a little touch football game too, because we we're, we keep them going with all the sports. And as of today, I just got news from the Harvard baseball coach that I have a meeting with the Harvard athletic director in October to see if we can expand through Dylan Branca, uh, student, uh, student leader, pitcher, and social entrepreneur has egged us on to expand the books and balls program to other colleges. And it looks like Harvard University is going to be the first one to expand out of UCLA. Thank you, Dylan Branca. Congratulations. Where do you see the program in five years? You've got a crystal ball. What do you see in it? Well, thank you so much for these wonderful young men. Uh, I just mentioned Dylan Branca, um, his dad, John Branca, the Branca family, all the people who've gotten involved with Club 42, Coach Savage, now Coach Becker at Harvard. Just think that if we're able to get this thing going with our Books and Balls program, uh, and we keep it going uh, at, at UCLA and we can get it going at Harvard, I feel that this, this could spread and that we could see 42 books and balls programs at other great colleges and universities. And uh, I'm 60 years old and this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. So I'm hoping that it's going to catch on and we're going to see a lot of young black American multi-sport athletes um, out on college baseball fields in the next 15 to 20 years. Let's hope that it all comes to fruition. I'm sure it will. It sounds like you've got some good momentum right now. Well, Coach Johnny, I want to thank you for joining us today on the Prospect Blueprint. And I certainly look forward to following the organization as it, as it spreads out nationwide and becomes all that it can be. Um, how can you or the organization be reached? Is it going to be at the club42.org? That's the best contact? Uh, well, no. You know, our website is, is go42.org. Go42.org. So, and if you do go to our website, go42.org, all the contact information there is there. I even think there's a donate button and uh, we just love to spread the, the spirit of the 42. And, and um, it's just been wonderful to be able to just chat about it with you today, Kelly. I can't thank you enough for having me. A pleasure having you. And folks, don't forget that's the One Glove event. It's September 21st and 22nd at UCLA. It will be live streamed. All colleges are welcome to jump on that stream and even attend the events. Um, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Kelly Kleiman, and this is the Prospect Blueprint. Subscribe, like, comment, and most of all, share not just this podcast, but goodwill as well. Have a nice day.